It took Maxwell over 10 years and multiple papers to shape those equations in these final forms. The main difficulty was that Faraday's field concept was extremely hard to grasp because fields are intangible by nature. Today, we take for granted that concepts like electric and magnetic fields are fundamentals and cannot be reduced to something else, but it was far from obvious for the scientists at that time. Maxwell thus had to rely on analogies and mechanical models. From a 21st century perspective, these models may seem bizarre and even outlandish. However, Maxwell took it seriously, and to fully understand his work, we must too. Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic radiation was undoubtedly his most significant contribution. The venture into electromagnetism started when French engineer and physicist Charles Augustin de Coulomb demonstrated the inverse square force law between two charged particles at rest. This was a static force, as charges were not moving. Galvani demonstrated that inserting dissimilar metals in a frog's legs caused it to move. Interestingly, this was how electric current was discovered. Volta suspected these dissimilar metals must be the cause, and even developed early versions of batteries. By doing this, he had now discovered a controllable source of electric current. Until now, electricity and magnetism have been considered a different phenomenon. This changed in 1820 when Hans Christian Ersted noticed that the needle of a compass moved when brought near the wire carrying current. Thus, he demonstrated that electric current always induces a magnetic field. Several experiments quickly followed, and it was globally accepted that electricity and magnetism are closely related. However, a proper explanation was lacking. The most compelling one was proposed by the French physicist Ampère, who Maxwell referred to as the Newton of electricity. This was a fitting title because, in Ampere's and Newton's approaches, one object's motion can be affected by another object even without the two being in physical contact. Faraday, however, came out completely opposite. He proposed that electromagnetic interactions occur through fields rather than direct action at a distance. These fields exist in the space around magnets and electric currents, mediating the interactions. However, the majority of scientists, especially outside Britain, had failed to realize its significance, mainly because Faraday lacked mathematics. Ampere's work, in contrast, was mathematically rigorous, so it was left to followers of Faraday, particularly Kelvin and Maxwell, to formalize a field-based approach. Maxwell brought to this task skills, insights and attitudes that had developed through his education at Edinburgh and Cambridge. By that time, there were then four basic areas in electricity and magnetism that would have to be included in the full theory. 1. Electrostatics forces between static electric charges. 2. Magnetostatics. Forces among static magnetic materials. 3. Electromagnetism. Magnetic effects of electric current as discovered by Ersted 4. Electromagnetic induction. Electrical effects of changing magnetic fields as discovered by Faraday himself. Maxwell decided to first understand Faraday's work and intuition before doing any mathematics, a decision which proved to be very fruitful. Faraday had inspired Maxwell to think of electricity and magnetism in terms of field lines, just like water flow. Before we go into how Maxwell derived those equations, we must understand two slightly technical terms, vergences and flux. That should be enough to capture the main essence of Maxwell equations. Divergence at any given point is a measure of how fluid spreads out or comes together at that point. In this picture, you can see a source from where water is spreading out. The divergence at that point is positive, and you have a sink where the water is coming together. The divergence there is negative. Elsewhere, there's no spreading or gathering, and the divergence is zero. You can have multiple sources and sinks. Divergences are used everywhere in fluid dynamics, electromagnetism, and vector calculus. Curl, as the name suggests, measures the rotation or twistness of a fluid at any given point. For an analogy, suppose you drop a tiny twig into a flowing river. If the twig starts spinning in place, there is a curl at that point. In regions where the rotation is clockwise, 
The curl would be positive, while the curl would be negative in the region where the rotation is counterclockwise. The first paper Maxwell wrote on electromagnetism was titled On Faraday's Lines of Force, published in 1855. Merely as an analogy, Maxwell proposed that electric and magnetic fields could be thought of as incompressible fluids. Incompressible means that the fluid cannot be compressed into a smaller volume. A key property of an incompressible fluid is that its divergence is zero. This allowed Maxwell to immediately write down the mathematical expression for the behavior of magnetic fields. The divergence of the magnetic field is zero. This is the first Maxwell equation. The interpretation is that, unlike electric fields, there are no positive or negative magnetic charges that could act as a source or sink. Magnetic poles always come as a pair. Since the electric field has positive and negative charges that can act as a source or sink, the divergence of the electric field is equal to the charge density. This is the second Maxwell equation. In the fluid analogy, the positive charge regions correspond to the source of the electric field, while the negative charge corresponds to the sink. These two equations are also called Gauss's law for electric and magnetic fields, though Laplace was the one who first wrote it. I agree. The namings are quite weird. Gauss's law can be used to derive Coulomb's law and vice versa. The main limitation of this fluid analogy was its inability to explain the interactions between electric fields, magnetic fields, and electric currents. Maxwell's first two equations described only static charges. It took him another five years, along with insights from another great scientist, Lord Kelvin, to develop a theory of moving charges. Kelvin, alongside Maxwell, was working on providing a mathematical framework for Faraday's field ideas. Kelvin was an advocate of the vortex theory of the atom, which hypothesized that an atom was a vortex in the ether that pervades space. Kelvin suggested that these rotating vortices could serve as a model of a magnetic field. Just a side remark, this vortex theory was probably the first theory of atomic structures. Kelvin suggested that different kinds of knots at the center of the vortices could correspond to different chemical elements. Maxwell's friend Peter Tate classified these knots as up to 10 crossings, giving birth to knot theory, a popular topic in modern mathematics. However, as more elements were discovered, it became clear that any rational classification of knots could not explain this, and the theory slowly got abandoned. Maxwell found Kelvin's approach particularly attractive. From today's perspective, the molecular vortex model may seem bizarre and unworthy of serious consideration. However, Maxwell took it seriously, and to fully understand his work, we must too. He began with a model in which the whole space was filled with a vortex tube. This vortex tube represents the magnetic field, and the greater the velocity of the tube, the stronger the magnetic field. But there was an immediate problem. These rotating vortex tubes would experience friction, causing them to lose energy. Maxwell adopted a practical solution by inserting ball bearings between the vortices, which he identified as electric particles. When these ball bearings are free to move, they carry an electric current. In conductors, these electric particles are free to move, whereas in insulators, they are fixed. In 1861, he published a paper titled On Physical Lines of Force with these mechanical models. In that paper, he had a slightly different version where hexagons represent the vortices. The ball bearings are current carrying particles. Remarkably, this model could explain all known phenomena of electromagnetism. In this diagram, the change in the speed of the vortices corresponds to the change in the strength of the magnetic field. This would cause the ball bearings to rotate in response to the changing speeds of the adjacent vortices. Since rotation corresponds to the curl, we get the third Maxwell's equations. The curl of the electric field equals the change in magnetic field. Now we are left with the final equation. For this, let's consider this Maxwell's mechanical model. Trust me, this is the last one. In the center, we have an electric current. The electric current forces the vortices to rotate as an infinite series of vortex rings about the wire. Correctly, the magnetic field lines form circular loops about the current. This gives us the following relationship. 
curl of the magnetic field is proportional to the change in the electric field. Why proportional and not equal? Maxwell, again using these mechanical models, realized that this equation needed a correction term called displacement current. This gives us the final Maxwell equation. Curl of the magnetic field equals the change in the electric field plus a displacement current. These molecular vortices were modeled to be elastic objects. Therefore, it was possible for him to compute the velocity with which disturbances could propagate through them. It was then a straightforward calculation, and to his amazement, the velocity turned out to be equal to the speed of light. In a single stroke, then electricity, magnetism, and light were unified. While Maxwell was greatly inspired by these mechanical models, over the years, he slowly started losing confidence in them. Finally, in 1865, at the age of 34, he presented a monumental paper titled A Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field, where he retreated from all the specifics of the molecular vortices model. Instead, he presented the whole theory on a much more abstract basis without any special assumptions. Science historian Whitaker writes about this as follows. In this, the architecture of his system was displayed, stripped of the scaffolding by the aid of which it had been first erected. In this paper, the equations appear in their final form, quite independent of the means by which they had been established. The result was a dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field, which was still a mechanical theory, but abstract and general rather than concrete and pictorial. Electric and magnetic fields are abstractions that are not reducible to mechanical models. It is easy to see why this should be the case. The unit of electric field strength is the square root of a joule per cubic meter. There is no way we can imagine measuring directly the square root of a joule. We, with the advantage of hindsight, can clearly see that Maxwell's paper was one of the most significant scientific achievements of the 19th century, perhaps second only to Darwin's origin of species. However, for more than 20 years, his theory was largely ignored. Even Kelvin, who had worked closely with him before, found Maxwell's paper hard to understand. Maxwell's theory was just one of many theories of electromagnetism, and it was not clear what advantage it offered over Ampere's style. His complicated mechanical models made the matter even worse. There was also a second reason that Maxwell was absurdly and infuriatingly modest. At a huge conference in 1870, Maxwell described his own theory as another theory of electricity which I prefer, downplaying its significance. While there were other theories of electromagnetism, one feature clearly separated Maxwell's theory from them. It was a distinctive prediction that light was an electromagnetic wave. The matter was finally laid to rest 10 years after Maxwell's death in a classical series of experiments by German physicist Heinrich Hertz. Hertz found that he could detect the effect of electromagnetic induction at considerable distances from his apparatus. The frequencies of these waves were related to the inductance and capacitance of the emitter. When he computed the velocity of those waves, it turned out to be equal to the velocity of the light in free space. He knew that the waves were electromagnetic in origin because his spark gap emitter produced them. This was the final proof of the validity of Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's model was an extreme example of model building in theoretical physics. Maxwell originally expressed his electromagnetic theory in a complex system of 20 equations with 20 variables, presented in component form. Oliver Heaviside and Gibbs later cleaned it and presented these into the four elegant vector equations we recognize now. The ultimate importance of the Maxwell theory is far greater than its immediate achievement in explaining and unifying the phenomena of electricity and magnetism. Its ultimate importance is to be the prototype for all the great triumphs of 20th century physics. It is the prototype for Einstein's theories of relativity and quantum mechanics, for the Yang-Mills theory of generalized gauge invariance, and for the unified theory of fields and particles that is known as the standard model of particle physics. All these theories are based on the concept of dynamical fields introduced by Maxwell in 1865.